What if I told you that you can get any man you're dating to fully respect you? What if I also told you you don't even have to actually ask him to respect you in order to do this properly? If that sounds impossible to you, don't worry. On today's show, we're going to be discussing how to force men to respect you. That way, you never have to get mistreated or disrespected by any man you're dating ever Again, so let's start off with number one, which is gonna be horror stories. Anytime you're dating a guy, okay? At the beginning, he's always gonna be essentially seeing your past relationships through the perspective of him. See, what you end up talking about is disrespect. And not just disrespect, you end up talking about disrespect that you forgave. You talk about your mistreatment. You talk about all the ways he took advantage of you. And even after, you know, he disrespected me multiple times in the same way, with the same circumstances, he was always able to come back after that. Even to the point where now, as we set, sit on this dinner date and we're slurping spaghetti in front of each other, I still uh, have his number. And if he wanted to text me, if he wanted to call me, if he wanted to reach out to me, he could. Why? Would I spend all my time, energy, and resources trying to be this most amazing guy when even if I'm a horrible guy who disrespects her and mistreats her, I'll still be able to come back from it. Now, what we're trying to do instead, I want you to talk very intensely about cutting people off. And what I mean by that is when I was in a relationship or a situationship in which this guy disrespected me, in which he mistreated me, in which he cheated on me, in which he went behind my back. Right after you describe that disrespect, right after you describe that mistreatment, you begin to describe how after you came to that realization that that level of disrespect was happening in your relationship, you immediately cut that man off from ever getting access to you again. This is so, so important. Here's the other thing that I actually want you to get good at when you're telling people these horror stories, okay? I don't really give people chances. Once I see bad behavior, I really am very quick to cut them off and let them go. So it doesn't take me 35, 45, 55, 75 times of getting cheated on before I realize I gotta let someone go out of my life. In fact, in a lot of situations, I let people go even earlier than 45 or 50th chance uh, while they're still apologizing and begging for my forgiveness because I just tolerate that disrespect so little. I do want you to paint a very clear visual because men are always visualizing what your past relationships have been to compare themselves to your past partners and say, okay, I'm either able to meet them where they have been with their past partners, or I'm not capable of that, or that's definitely something I can go above and beyond and do even better than her past partners. So I say that to say, these horror stories all need to sound like this. And you gotta make sure that you avoid making your stories sound like this. This is your very first opportunity when you go out on a date with the guy to let them know you demand respect in your relationships. Number two, I want us to imagine a scenario together. Your coworker is really upset about some of the things that have been going on at work. Let's say for the sake of example, you guys get really low pay. So he stands up to your boss and he starts yelling, okay? He says, boss, why the hell have you been treating us like this? We can't stand for this anymore. He throws the laptop. He's like, these laptops are slow. They don't work. They're inconvenient. So let's say at the end of this whole rant, your coworker says, I want a raise. And you're like, oh my God, if my coworker does this and it works, I'm definitely gonna do the same thing because uh, I wanna race too. Let's say for the sake of example, when your coworker does this, your boss says, John, can you and the rest of the security escort this man out and please take his badge, uh, take his laptop, uh, take anything that belongs to this office, make sure he doesn't leave with it, deactivate his key card and all his codes to get in any part of the building, also get him offline of the slack. And you never hear from that coworker again. Now, after experiencing that and seeing all of that happen, what are you most likely to do? If I don't wanna end up jobless like my coworker, I probably shouldn't do the same things as my coworker did. And I want you to strategically get good at throwing coworkers out, right? And allowing him to see firsthand situations that happen with you and a friend, 
You and a family member, you and a coworker, you and anyone in your life that comes across you where they try you. And trust me, those of you who are thinking, oh, well, nobody's tried. People will try you. It's going to happen all the time. Okay, so don't worry. That time will come. And when someone tries you, I want you to keep him updated on what's happening and what's transpiring. That way, you can use this as an example, a first-hand example that he can see in real time of someone trying you, you will get fired, okay? You will go right out the door and we're gonna deactivate your key card. We do not take disrespect here. If someone's gonna approach me and be in my life, they're either gonna do it the right way or they're not gonna do it at all and I feel no ways about that. This is perfect. Because remember, before you were telling him horror stories, that was one. Now this is two, where you're now giving him an actual third, or I guess we could say second person perspective, where he's able to have firsthand knowledge in real time of someone trying you and trying to take advantage of you, even if it's not in a romantic sense, and you putting your foot down and saying, no, I'm actually not going to take this disrespect. Do not allow yourself to fall victim to gateway drugs. You got something very important to do, tomorrow morning, but you do want to hang out with your friends. So tonight you're going out to the club, but you say, gonna stay sober tonight. But tonight when you go out to the bar, it's an amazing night. It's 7 p.m. Friday, it's 95 degrees, you don't got no N-word, and no N-word doesn't have me. And on top of that, today when you went out, you were having a perfect hair day, you were having your perfect makeup day, and you went and got, you know, did legs today, so now you've got a glute pump, so your dump truck looks even more amazing. Your girlfriend comes up to you. These guys over here, these other supermodel guys, they said they wanted to buy all of us a round of drinks. Based on the fact that you're so beautiful, he said, whoever she's with, we're buying drinks for all of you. But you said you're not drinking. What? One drink. One drink is it's not gonna, it's not gonna, I'll be fine. I'll have one drink, I'm not gonna get angry. But then, when you take the one drink, now you're feeling good. Now they're playing sexy red. Five, five, caramel skin. Uh, this bitch you ten. I'm a son, no new friends. Uh, catch me sliding in the bench. And then your friend comes up to you again and she says, girl, these guys won't leave me alone. They want you so bad. They want you and me to come over there and take a couple more shots. Two more in you. You've got three. So they're like, nah, F this. We like you guys so much, we buying a bottle. Three more drinks. And that turns into two more drinks all of a sudden you're drunk now and when you wake up out of your like drowsy sleep you're like what's going on what day is it today <gasps> oh my god i have all this stuff to do you look at your phone and it's 1 p.m you've missed basically half the stuff that you have to do you have 13 missed calls you have uh, 14 text messages and you have 15 emails you missed work you missed this other thing you're supposed to do and you missed this other thing you're supposed to do. But yesterday started out with I'm not drinking. Now, I know some of you are thinking to yourself, Thompson, what does any of this have to do with my relationships or the guys talking to me? When you have the first drink, the first drink isn't actually just about the first drink. The first drink is about making it easier to take the second drink. And the second drink isn't just about the second drink. The second drink is about making it easier to say yes to the third drink. And every time you say yes to the one thing, you're just making it easier for yourself to say yes to the next thing. So if you just never drank in the first place, it actually, the easiest time it was for you to say no was before you took a single drink. That was the hardest decision. Every single time after that, the decision became easier and easier and easier and easier. The gateway drugs that I'm referring to is like, for example, telling a guy, hey, I'm not gonna sleep with you on the first night, okay? I don't do that, I'm not that type of girl. But you have fun with him, you guys are having a good time, you go back to his place, you guys are having some more wine, some more drinks, and then all of a sudden, your legs are spread wide open, and now, instead of him penetrating you, he's eating you out, okay? I know that's graphic. I hope the under 20 year old people are gone. So yeah, theoretically, you didn't sleep with him, but also you've given him, given him the impression that when you say something, eh, there's ways around it and you know, it's not really like a hard, fast rule. When you allow these gateway drugs to get you off track or to make it seem like you're not serious when you say things, 
right? Or guys don't have to take you serious when you say things. Now, all of a sudden, in the future, when you say, I'm not drinking again to your friends, what do your friends start thinking? Ah, guys, don't worry. We just got to make the mood right and she'll get drunk again. Same way in your relationships, right? You'll say, oh, I'm not sleeping with you. We're not doing anything. And then when you open your legs and he's eating you out that same night, sure, he didn't sleep with you, but he's thinking in his mind, yeah, she said one thing, but I still got her to do some stuff that she probably wouldn't have regularly done with most guys. Okay, so it all works out the same way because they start to see it as, oh, you know what? I don't really have to respect those boundaries. Attention is like currency. So let's say in your bank account, $10,000. Yeah. But let's also say on an average month you spend, but let's imagine all of a sudden you stop making money. So you stop getting a reoccurring $10,000 every month. Now you're minusing 8K one month. Okay, cool. You still have 2,000 left. Now on the next month, you're minusing 8K, but there's no 10K coming in. So now you're in credit card debt 6K. What you have to understand is every time that you're in a relationship with a guy and you are showing him hatred or love, one of the two, okay? I hate you so much, you're the worst person ever. Why do you do this? I wanna slash your tires. I'm gonna bleach your clothes. You're actually depositing money into this bank. You're depositing money into this bank because what you don't realize is attention is currency, okay? And you wanna know how he's spending it? Not on you. He's spending it on other things and himself and maybe even other people. So until you finally stop depositing that $10,000 a month into that bank account is when you realize you've been spending so much that you're now in credit card debt. Okay, I should have put a minus there. I want you to understand how important it is to punish men with indifference because when you do that, that's when you actually stop depositing money into his bank account. And every time you're going crazy on men, it's trying to beg or plead them or convince them that they should respect you. That doesn't work. And only when you stop depositing that money into his bank account will he realize he needs to make a change or make an adjustment in your relationship and stop treating you that way. You want the men that you're dating to be begging you for redemption. When a guy is experiencing pleasure, he's gonna be thinking, I wanna do it again. Let's imagine instead of the experience being pleasurable, the experience for him is painful. In his thoughts, when he thinks about this situation, he's gonna think, don't do it again. But if you're showing them attention by giving him the, all that hatred and going crazy and going hysterical, you're depositing money into that bank account and you're actually showing him pleasure instead of showing him pain. So when he thinks back to the experience of how crazy you went when he did something to you, he's now thinking, damn, that girl's crazy. She must really like me. She must really want me. That was a real good ego boost for me. The reason I want you to make them beg for redemption is because I want them to have a painful experience disrespecting you. That way they can start associating that with pain and know I should probably stop doing that. When you show them indifference and when you make them work so hard to get back in your good graces, it's a clear example of, hey, you do a bad thing, you get punished for it. And when you get punished for it, it's even going to be difficult to return to the state that you were in before. You can't make guys feel like, even if it's a little bit painful, that after a while, you know, all he has to do is say sorry to you a couple of times. And when he says sorry to you a couple of times, everything will be fine again very quickly. I had to go through so much to recover from the mistake that I made of disrespecting you that now that I'm finally back, I will never do that again.